So when the conflict in Ukraine first broke out, Tri-Cities released an article with my and my wife's face on it, and it was titled, House Divided. Now, this article is from 2000... Which date is this? 2014. So, this has been a while. Interestingly, right here, this photo was taken. The article is actually pretty positive. Tri-City Herald is not always very positive toward Christian things, but this article was very positive. It was a Sunday edition. It was everywhere in Tri-Cities. Somebody read the title without reading the article and started a rumor that Vlad is getting divorced. <laughs> and he wants to publicize his divorce. So he went into the local newspaper and announced his divorce. Now, you would think who would spread this is witch doctors, warlocks, you know, it was actually Christian pastors. Christian pastors, in fact, bishops in uh, areas I'm not going to mention, not going to mention their names. Within a day, like wildfire spread that this church, Hungry Gen, has messed up pastors who not only live in sin secretly, they're not ashamed of it publicly. My pastor calls me and he said, hey, uh, I know you're not getting divorced. Where is this coming from? I said, I don't know. The throne of the pit of hell. I said, me and my wife are doing good. We've been married for four years. We love each other, but we're not getting divorced. Uh, you know us. And he says, where is this could be coming from? And then I went to Starbucks and I look at the paper and I see my face on it and how it's divided. I said, maybe perhaps not knowing English fully and not reading well, you can come to that conclusion that his house is being divided because he's getting divorced. Something I've learned growing up in the church and being in ministry and that is many Christians have critical spirit, not critical thinking. Charles Spurgeon said, the church is imperfect, but woe to the man who takes pleasure in pointing out her imperfections. The Bible says that God is truth. Jesus is the way, the truth and life. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth who guides us in all the truth. We must speak truth and the truth sets people free. It's interesting, the Bible does not say that CNN is the source of truth. The Bible doesn't say BBC is the source of truth. The Bible also does not say that a self-proclaimed prophet, apostle, YouTuber is the spirit of truth. The Bible also does not say that because you have a position in the church, you become the truth. Christians are to point to the truth, but many times Christians are not the source of the truth. The reason why is because many believers, and this is from my personal experience, lack critical thinking. Instead, they have a critical spirit. I was listening this week to uh, Craig Rochelle's podcast on leadership, and he said something that really touched me. He said, a cognitive bias is a systematic error in thinking when your brain wrongfully filters information through your personal experiences and preferences. In other words, it's when your thinking is a little bit messed up. You filter things. See, we don't see the world the way it is. We see the world the way we are. And he said, three biases that we have. Confirmation bias, it's a tendency to search for and interpret information in a way that confirms your previous preconceptions. The status quo bias, it's when you prefer what's known over what's the unknown. And when the alternative options are objectively better. Anchoring bias, it's when you take too much weight on the first information you received about a subject. You know, in being in ministry, if you work with people, if you're a manager or a supervisor and one of the employees comes in and let's say makes an accusation against another employee and it sounds so right, it sounds so convincing 
And if you jump on that and make a decision based on that information without having critical thinking, without doing some research and without asking the opposite view, you can quickly jump to the conclusion and realize you just made a wrong decision. A lady came to our church when I was just a youth pastor. I think I was 17 years of age. It was the first um, older uh, Caucasian, just kind of like the way it is, a white lady that came to our church. She was not Russian. All right. We were excited. I'm like, we're going we're gonna to keep this person in our church. And her first thing when she comes to church was this. A pastor who was a friend of mine. I went to this pastor's 5 a.m. morning prayers Monday almost through Friday. Me and Pastor Ilya. And her first accusation is this pastor abuses people and he abused me. Now I'm 17. I go to this guy's prayer. Seems fine to me, but I don't know him. So she keeps coming and literally she barely talks about anything about our church. Everything just bashing about the church. Now I show up to this guy's prayer meeting. I'm like 17 years of age. I'm learning to pray. He's teaching me how to fast. And I'm half of the time I'm like, uh, this guy is an abuser. I don't know what I do. I call police. I'm like, what do we do with this stuff? I mean, do I, does he have a board and, and, and all of this stuff? She comes for six months. And I'm like confused in my head. Six months later, she sends me an email. She says, I'm leaving the church and I'm going back to the same church. And I said, but you were abused. He said, oh, that's not really what happened. I said, you told me that every week for six months. <laughs> she says, well, I, I, I misread the information. It wasn't like that. And I was like, you got to be kidding. I'm like, I almost sent her the verse from Revelation where liars will have the lake, place in the lake of fire. And I was like, you just, you almost turned me against a minister that I personally knew. I went to his house. I knew him over a lame accusation that you made. And now you went back to that ministry. And, and I've had a lot of that happen with believers. Where I want to encourage us as our church to have wisdom and discernment. And not to be rash, impulsive quick to speak, quick to anger, slow to listen, and slow to investigate. Denzel Washington said, if you don't read the news, you're uninformed. If you read the news, you're misinformed. <laughs> Not everything that comes through your television is truth. And we live through COVID, we know that to be the truth. Media is biased. This does not mean that we become skeptical. This just simply means we don't swallow everything as the truth without doing proper research, investigation, and we are people of the truth. We cannot be moved by what's hot and trendy. Not everything that's trendy is the truth. Not everything that's hot is holy. And not everything that's popular is right. And not every majority speaks for morality. A crowd shouted, crucified him. Jesus deserves to die. And they all were wrong. All of the communism and said, Christians are stupid, uneducated. Their God is dead. All of communism was wrong. And they're dead. And Christianity is still thriving. <laughs> Critical thinking is... Analytical process that involves asking questions, seeking to understand, addressing issues or actions. It's driven by humility, curiosity and a unifying purpose. A critical spirit is a negative fault finding that tears down rather than builds up. It's marked by pride, indifference to people and context and seeks to divide than to unite. Hungry Jan, we will not possess a critical spirit. We will possess a critical thinking. We don't bash other churches, the churches we disagree with. We don't attack other churches that preach Jesus, point to Jesus and do things differently. And if you come from another church and you want to build a group at our church that bashes other people, I'm going to tell you one thing, you will find an enemy in me. Because I don't shoot our own brothers. We have an enemy, his name is Satan. It's not the pastor that you came from. And it's not the church that you came from. But they do things differently. Yes. And you will see a lot of things even here that might be different. But if they preach Jesus. If they preach the Lord. If they point people to Jesus. If they preach holiness and righteousness. They are our friends. Not our enemies. Yeah. 
We forgot that Jesus promised that his followers will be falsely accused. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 11 and 12, I do have to remind us of this verse. It says, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you. But I want you to notice the third persecution and say all kinds of evil against you. Did you see this word? Falsely for my sake. Number 12, verse 12. Make sure you make statements and make videos to destroy all of their arguments on YouTube. <laughs> verse 12. Make sure you make a statement quickly so that people don't misunderstand you. Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward not on YouTube, but in heaven. For they so persecuted the prophets who were before you. Sometimes people ask, why don't you make a statement? Because I take pride in being falsely accused. I get brownie points in heaven. Why? Because Joseph was falsely accused and the evidence they presented was fabricated. Why? Because Jezebel found elders, pay them off so that they can destroy that innocent man and kill him. Why? Because my Savior was called with all kinds of names. I'll give you a few examples of what they called him. They said he was out of his mind. They said he's trying to destroy the temple. They said he was a glutton and a drunk. He had a demon. They said he was demon possessed and insane. They said he was an evil doer worthy of death. They said he blasphemed. They said he perverted a nation and forbidden people to pay taxes. All these were lies. And guess who said these things? People who had positions of authority in a religious circle. These were not thugs, drug dealers or warlocks. These were people that claimed to serve God. What does that mean for us? This simply means we should not rush, be impulsive or to feel like Every single thing that is said against us, we have to have an attorney for and we have to attack those people. I understand America has more attorneys per capita than any other nation in the world. But biblically speaking, Christians did not always drag everybody to court. Biblically speaking, Christians were killed, martyred. No, they were not a doormat, but they were slaughtered for the cause of Christ. My great grandpa sat in jail for five years, dragged by a horse and then killed. For the cause of Christ. Communists never apologized and he never sought their apology. So to live with a little bit of persecution, a little bit of being misunderstood and a godless anti-Christian, anti-America, anti-Israel sources to come against us, we have to develop a little bit of a thicker skin as Christians to live being misunderstood. And let people lie in trying to accuse us because there's nothing to stick to us. Live with such an integrity that people have to lie about you to blame you. And I can tell you stories when in younger days our church was made fun of. I was personally accused of certain things that had absolutely had nothing to do with me and absolutely was not true. It happened in one place where my, my wife worked and I was so outraged. I got in my car and I decided I'm gonna drive there and I'm going to sit that whole business place straight and I'm gonna clear my name. As I got in my car driving there the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said suck it up and take it. I said that's not right, that's, that's not fair, they're spreading lies. He said, they are committed to misunderstanding you. Nothing you say will matter. He said, if he wanted to know the truth, he has your number, he would have called you. I said, but God, it hurts me. And God says, lean on me. I will vindicate you. And he said, because it's not true, lies, they don't last very long. Liars get caught in their own web of lies. Years passed. And God started to bless our ministry. That very person that did that in the community sat upstairs in my office and asked for my forgiveness. Wow. 
I brought evidence that I was innocent, physical evidence. And I told him, I can bury you with what you did because of the evidence that I have. And I presented to him, he apologized. He explained to me how what he did to me, it backfired on him because somebody else did it to him and it really hurt him deeply. And I left that meeting feeling vindicated by God, not by the legal system even that I could have gotten involved. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but I know one thing about God. He's watching everything. And at the end of the day, we all walk before Him and every person will give an account for what they say about other people. Sometimes we say things out of ignorance. Sometimes we have a, a, just an evil intent to destroy somebody. At the end of the day, there is a God and He will make things right. So as a church, as a hungry gen church, we fight against the gates of hell. We rescue the lost. We don't create campaigns of smearing other people, attacking other people. And for those of you who have a vendetta maybe, or you come and you love to stir trouble, stir drama against other Christians and other believers, I want to tell you something. Please get a hike. And don't come and stay in our church with that attitude because we do not celebrate that. The devil is still the father of lies. Everyone still lies to his neighbor. Paul was falsely accused, arrested and imprisoned. Early Christians were, condem were condemned for burning Rome. Atheism and cannibalism and sexual orgies, all of these were lies. At the end of 2023, the Innocence Project has achieved 249 victories in overturning wrongful convictions. And in 2022 alone, the U.S. saw the record of 260. 238 exonerations including the national according to the national registry of exonerations which means you can accuse somebody destroy somebody and be 100% wrong and that's a court system today in the court system you're innocent until proven guilty in Christian circles you're always guilty until proven innocent and Christians can be wrong. You can be wrong. I can be wrong. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 and 11, it says this about the accuser of the brethren. In Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 and 11, it says this, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them day and night before God has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives to death. I want you to notice there is an accuser of the brethren. But it speaks of Jesus in Hebrews. It says that amongst the brethren, Jesus will proclaim God's name. Let me ask you a question. When your constant ministry approach to Christian faith is exposing discernment ministries, all of that is really another, another fancy word for accusing of the brethren. You have to ask yourself a question, whose team are you playing on? Because Jesus proclaims to the brethren about God's name. If all we're doing is airing dirty laundry of brethren everywhere, we are really somehow connected to the ministry of the accuser of the brethren. Jesus washes the bride with his word. He doesn't beat his bride with his word. He died for the bride. He doesn't crucify the bride. If I would get up today and say embarrassing things about my wife, how shameful it is for me as a husband. If you would get up and embarrass my wife and show something inappropriate, I will tell you one thing, turn the other cheek won't work here. I will reach the ghetto part of me or whatever. I will find that part in me and we're going to have a problem. And then I will ask for forgiveness later. But you, get, you can't talk about my wife like that. Why? Because she's my wife. 
She's my flesh and blood. That's why Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We are the same body of Jesus Christ. We can't go accusing, attacking each other, washed by the same blood. <laughs> Forgiven by the same Jesus. And I love the fact that Jesus says, this accuser attacks my brothers to me, but I'm giving my blood to my brothers to attack the accuser. Jesus does not give the devil ammo. He doesn't give him fuel and says, yeah devil, you're attacking them. Let me tell you some other things you don't know. No, no, no. Jesus tells his brothers, his followers and says, here's my blood. Not only to wash your sins, but when that accuser comes, I want you to use my blood and fight him. What Christians do today is they fight with the accuser against the brethren. My friends, we're all saved by the same Jesus. We're indwelled by the same Holy Spirit. We all are in the process of sanctification. Sometimes we trip and we fall. We all have things, if we magnify in our life our faults and our sins, we will feel ashamed, guilty, full of confusion, full of doubt. That's why Jesus gives us His blood, His Word and His Spirit. Do not join the devil in his mission to accuse the brethren. Funny how the devil doesn't accuse drug dealers. The devil doesn't accuse all the other sins. He accuses brethren because they are the threat to him. And many Christians today are using that tactic to attack other Christians. Amongst ourselves, we have to judge ourselves in the church. When you know a brother, when you know a sister who's committing sin, you go to them. But that's different than making a video about them. That's different than not knowing a brother, not caring enough to be on your knees, to weep for them. Instead, for six hours investigating. What happened to intercession? Leonard Ravenhill, they asked him, you always attack the church and Le uh, Leonard Ravenhill, if you read any of his books, I mean this guy was like a John the Baptist on steroids. <laughs> Except he woke up at four in the morning until ten. For six hours he was on his knees and he says, the only reason I can whip the church is because I weep for the church every day. He says, I weep six hours a day for the church. He says, it comes out of a place of brokenness. Today I don't trust people who get up and attack, but they never pray. They attack, but they never fast for the church. They never weep for the church. They're never even going to church. But they know how the church is supposed to be. Love the church. I love the church. The church is full of imperfect people. I've been accused by the church. I've been mistreated by the church, but Jesus gave His life for the church. Jesus loves the church. I volunteer at the church, not because of what I can get out. It's because Jesus' body, Jesus' bride and Jesus' building, it matters to Him. It's His bride. I will love the church because of that. And I will contribute to the church's health and well-being instead of to its destruction, division and hurt. Amen. The body of Jesus is very important to Jesus and it's supposed to be important to us. It saddens me seeing many pastors are exposing the mistakes of other ministries instead of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. The assignment of every pastor is to equip the saints, not to expose other mistakes. Now maybe somebody is called to do that, but I know what we're called to prophets, pastors and teachers, equip the body not expose the mistakes and the sins and all of this stuff. That is not our place. Our place is to equip. The Bible says go into all the world and make disciples. You know what that's been replaced? Go into your studio and make videos. Go on your computer and make a blog. That's fine. You can do that. But where is the disciples? Where are the people you're winning to Christ? Where are those people that are maturing in Jesus? Where is the small group? But sometimes you dig deep into ministries that go into a full-blown accusing, attacking all the time, you realize they don't even go to church anymore. They're not even connected anywhere. That's not my tribe. I'm sorry. My tribe loves local church, builds a local church, and we glorify Jesus, and we improve, and we grow in discernment for the glory of God. I have a friend of mine, pastor, 
from another country. He went to a mission trip and he got, I think it was malaria. And uh, because of that, he probably had some other genetic things that he was predisposed and he developed what they call autoimmune disease. Autoimmune disease is when your body's immune system mistakenly attacks its own cells, tissues and organs, leading to inflammation and damage. There are many different types of autoimmune diseases including rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, among others. Each autoimmune disease affects the body parts and it can cause a wide range of symptoms. I feel like the body of Jesus Christ sometimes is experiencing autoimmune disease where we attack our own body. We attack our own. Romans 14, 19, it says, Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one might edify another. 1 Corinthians 1, 10, it says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and there is no divisions among you, that you are perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 and 3, with all loneliness, lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or, or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Family of God, we must fight, but not each other. We can be different without being destructive. We can disagree without being disrespectful. The first murder in the Bible happened when two brothers killed each other. It's still happening today. We murder people's reputations by saying things out of jealousy, envy, insecurity, ignorance. And we have to be very careful that God's family doesn't have murder of hate and bitterness. When God separated the 12 tribes, gave the tribe of Judah to the Jewish king, to the David's descendants. And then the other 10 tribes, He gave it to another person. And they went to fight. And the Lord said this in 1 Kings chapter 12, 24. He said, you shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. We pray the Lord's prayer. And it's interesting, before we say Father, we say our Father. What does that mean? We acknowledge in the Lord's Prayer, our relationship with God is not just personal, it's also corporate. It's not just my Father in heaven, it's our Father, which means we're family. He's not just your God, He's our God. He's our Father. And if you have kids, I don't have physical children, in the, uh, one is in the oven right now. For those of you who have a lot of children, like my grandma, she has said 16. My parents have five. One of the things that my parents never liked and it broke their heart is when we fought. Oh, we love to fight. When, and I'm the oldest of five, so I kept the, kept the family in balance. But we had church service and one time I remember we had a, a, ch a church membership meeting when we were kids. A lot of fighting were happening. Mom, mom and dad came in and said, what's happening? I said, mom, it's a deacon meeting. We fight, I mean, we threw chairs at each other and, and, and our parents, I loved our parents is because when we would fight, we all get spanked. All of us. There was no right and wrong. All of us were guilty. And it was very painful. So I knew always when we fought that, that I had to win the fight before mom and dad gets involved because all of us will get equal punishment. It broke my parents' hearts to see us fight. The Bible clearly tells us that we fight against not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. God commands blessings on brothers that dwell in unity. Jesus prayed for us to be as one as the three persons in the Trinity are one. Now I want to bring this message to the part that I think is very important. Because I don't want to seem also like there is no faults. That there is no evidence of abuse, hurt, misconduct, misbehavior and even sin in the church or among ministers. God can do His perfect work through imperfect people. The first healing that happened and the first healing that God recorded in the, New, in the Old Testament was Abraham was asked by God to pray for Abimelech's wives while Abraham was caught in deceit. 
Hannah received her miracle by going to a place that had not an accusation but a biblical truth of sexual immorality in the temple. Hannah goes in there completely oblivious, ignorant to what's happening, sexual misconduct. They're abusing the sacrifices of God. She's weeping over there and God meets her and gives her a boy. She takes this boy and takes this boy to a corrupt, sexually perverted place and puts her boy there. Like that's not safe. Somebody should have told her, do you know that Eli's sons can influence your boy and he can go crooked. But Samuel didn't become crooked even though he was in a place that did not have good people. God still met him there and God used him there. There are times that I went to ministries and I was connected with ministries. I went to some revivals. Later on I found out this person fell or when revival was happening they were committing this particular sin that I wasn't aware of it. And sometimes people will come and they will say, oh Vlad is contaminated because I, had a, I saw a photo of him being at this place. I saw a photo of him being at that place. There's 20 more photos you didn't see that I've been to that are probably worse than the places you think I've been to. And I can tell you one thing, a hunger for God causes us to be able to learn from places that maybe we don't agree with everything on. But if they preach Jesus, if the Lord confirms the ministry with signs and wonders, I don't have to agree with every single thing to, be, to begin to be inspired and to learn. I benefit from an Apple watch and the CEO is openly homosexual and I still use it on the stage without being homosexual. The Bible says you lazy person go to an ant and learn from an ant. Sometimes you can get lessons from an ant. God could use a donkey to speak to a prophet. God can mature and train us in places that might not be 100% perfect. But because of your purity, because of your hunger, because of your pursuit and also wisdom and critical thinking to eat the meat, throw away the bones, God will grow you and mature you. I read Psalms, I read Psalms almost every single day. I don't approve of David's murder. I read book of Proverbs. The last thing I read about Solomon, he went off the rails. I get blessed by book of Proverbs. I don't rip book of Proverbs away and say, look, this guy ended poorly. Everything he said cannot be trusted. We don't do that. And so I want to encourage you that God can use men and women who either are flawed. Like look at Samson. He was used by God. The guy was a womanizer. Elijah. We would never have Elijah or Samson in our church if they would have been alive. No offense. I'm comfortable reading about them. I wouldn't be comfortable having them on the stage. Or Isaiah. What if he pulls this whole naked thing? What if Elijah comes in and doesn't like some people on the parking lot and burns them to fire? I would feel very uncomfortable. But I read their stories and I get inspired by their faith. And God speaks highly of them. I want to tell you something. God is not American and you can't put him in your box. He's bigger than you and I. And he chooses to use people and you may say, why does, he God, why does God use all the flawed people? Because that's pretty much all that he has. <laughs> Men of God are like gloves. God is the hand. Some gloves are like this. They easily, they easily rip. If you go to the garden and you have this small little thorn and next thing that happens is these gloves will rip. Let's say that you finish some gardening and the gloves ripped. Do you go with your feet, destroy everything and say, let me start again? No. You replace the gloves. You don't replace the work. That's why God never removed or edited book of Proverbs. That's why God did not remove or edit book of Genesis with all of the misconduct that his men, like Jacob, two wives, no good idea. You look at what some of these men of God did that we still say, oh, what a great man of God. But there's a lot of things there that, that, that was ripped and it was wrong. And the Bible is clear about it. The Bible doesn't hide away and say, oh yeah, this was okay. Oh, because they moved in miracles. All this stuff is okay. Jesus made it very clear. You can cast out demons, heal the sick in His name. They're not demonic and still live in sin. And even walk away completely from Christ, from Christ because the gifts of God are not. God doesn't take them away just because you decide to go cuckoo crazy. You still have those gifts and you can still use those gifts even for God's glory. And Paul says some people preach and they absolutely have bad motives. But Paul's like, hey, I'm kind of glad the gospel is being preached. I mean, those people are pretty messed up, but I'm glad the gospel is being preached. 
What does this mean? That means if you see somebody moving in signs and wonders and miracles, this does not mean they have a right relationship with God. And secondly, just because they're used by God, it doesn't mean they have every area of their life perfect. Some people are like these gloves and some people are better gloves. There's some ministers, they have a very good foundation, good family they come from, good covering, good accountability. They have really good people in their life who guide them. I think I took this and there's the same right and left. All right, let's... Come on, somebody. <laughs> Amen. So, all the time. <sighs> Poor were blessed by money distributed by Judas, even though he was a thief. For every famous pastor that falls into sin, there are thousands of faithful pastors who don't. The only planes you see on the news are those that crash. But did you know that for every plane that crashes, there's 600, 260,000 that don't? But you don't see them on the news. Why? Because the only time you end up on the news, the only time an airplane ends up on the news is when it crashes. The only time a pastor ends up on the news now is when they fail. But I can tell you for every pastor that fails, there's thousands who live faithfully, love Jesus, love their family, walk in integrity and serve Jesus. Don't build your world around those that crash. Build your, focus your eyes on Jesus and remember there's many of us. We're not famous. We're not on the news. There's many, like for example, last year, total Christians of, who were killed for their faith was 5,621. You'll never see them on the news, but they lived for Jesus. Don't build your theology and don't build your church experience. Oh, this person fallen, this person fallen, this. It seems like all the pastors are falling. Remember, the news only covers the planes that crash. They don't cover those who faithfully serve. Why? Because those stories don't get clicks. And those stories are not interesting. What's interesting is drama. What's interesting is division. What's interesting is dirt. What's interesting is scandals. What's interesting is tabloids. That's what's interesting. That's what's people's appetite. That's why the news always focuses on that. But there is a good news. There's a remnant of men and women of God who fast, who pray, who seek the Lord, who build local churches, who build small groups, who generously live their life, who lead their families, who raise their children, love their wives, love their husbands, and they'll never be known on the news, but they're known in heaven. <laughs> Two extremes. The first extreme is demonizing men of God. And the other one is idolizing them. Some enthrone men of God to a place God never put them in. Men are just gloves. Guys, every pastor is just a glove. He's not the hand. God is the hand. He can use them as he wishes, but they can rip because men are flawed. They can come from hurt from their past, from abuse, generational curses, pressures from the outside, issues that they're dealing with, and they can rip faster than you realize. This doesn't mean that what God through them now has to be void. It just simply means people are not perfect and they can fall and they can fail. Yes, it hurts God's people when a minister falls, when the preacher that maybe you listen to, that's why you got to be careful so you don't idolize them. But when you've seen their nakedness, when you've seen their faults, do not demonize them either. Find a healthy balance. Don't enthrone them and don't also throw, throw stones at them. Throw stones at the head of Goliath, not at the head of your pastor. Amen. Drop the stone and pick up a mirror. Jesus condemned sin without throwing stones at sinners. I realized one thing is that sometimes when you see somebody fail, you know, people sometimes ask me, Vlad, why don't you expose other pastors who fail? There's some investigation was done and it's public. Everybody knows and they failed. Why you don't throw stones at them? Because Jesus teaches me when he, when somebody's caught in sin, don't rush to make a video and throw a stone. Pick up a mirror and look at yourself. 
People who can throw stones shouldn't be throwing stones because if you have a sin in your life, you have no right to throw stones at somebody. The only one who can throw a stone, his name is Jesus and he chose to die for sinners. But to all of us, quick to judge, quick to come to conclusions, Jesus says, hold on, hold on. Let me give you a mirror. Before you go trying to pluck something out of somebody else's eye, just, just, just check, check first if there's a log stuck in the back of your van. Your response to someone's sin can also be a sin. Let me say that again. Your response to someone's sin can also be a sin. Noah got drunk, very happy, got naked. And the Bible says two, one of his sons decided to make a big deal about it and make fun of him. His response to his father's sin was a sinful. It's interesting because the New Testament presents Noah as a righteous man. And the guy that did the exposing is presented as wicked. Your response to somebody's sin can also be a sin. You got to guard your heart. And the two brothers, decide, two sons decided to cover their faces and said, we don't want to see the nakedness. We want to cover that nakedness and we want to cover his sin. Now at first it seems like, oh wow, they were covering sin. The Bible says expose the, the deeds of darkness. Yes, but there is something about believer falling into sin that we shouldn't rush to throw stones in, but begin to cover them in prayer and say, God, bring conviction. Go into that person and say, hey, this is not right. This is what the Bible teaches. But when we begin to expose everybody else's sin, we have to be very careful because we might be contributing to our own personal faults and not please God. Moses had some sins and Miriam decided to you know go all at it and God wasn't happy about it. So as Christians let's learn to pick up a mirror when we're tempted to throw a stone. This doesn't mean there's no place for judgment. This doesn't mean there's no place for rebuking sin. There's, this does not mean that we don't go to a brother and, and bring a conviction. This simply means we don't develop a judgmental, critical, I'm better than you, self-righteous, lacking critical thinking, developing a critical spirit, impulsive, fault-finding spirit. Amen. Disagreeing on minor things doesn't make someone a false teacher. There's a difference between a false teaching and a false teacher. Bible teachers can be wrong about one area and still not be false teachers. A false teacher can be right about one area and still be a false teacher. Paul said, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Which tells me some people don't declare the whole counsel of God. They declare the basic things but they kind of don't talk about some other things. When Apollos was mighty in the scriptures but only knew the baptism of John, Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and they didn't make a video about him saying, look, false prophet alert, do not follow Apollos. No, they said, hey, Apollos, this is good, but there's a few things you need to also keep in mind. There's Jesus, he also baptizes people, he's the son of God. John, John's thing was to prepare for Jesus, so you're good, but, but there's just a few things you can improve on. They didn't call him a false teacher because Apollos was missing a few things in his teaching. As Christians, we agree on a lot of things. For example, the Bible is the Word of God. Jesus is the way to, to God, the way, the truth and life. Jesus is fully God, fully man. We agree. We're saved by grace through faith. As Christians, we agree on those things. There's a lot of things we don't agree on. For example, once saved, always saved. We will fight about that till we die. Will, the, will a rapture happen before tribulation and after tribulation? Should women be allowed to preach on the stage or not? We disagree on should the services be one hour long or two hours long or go to Africa seven hours long. We disagree. Should water baptism be by full immersion? Oh yeah, it's very clear in the Bible where Martin Luther believed you can sprinkle people. I disagree with that. That doesn't make Martin Luther a false teacher. Just because he had a one faulty teaching that's not major, it does not make him a false teacher. I can disagree vehemently about the fact that rapture is not going to happen before tribulation. And I can have a proof, historic proof and everything, but I have people who disagree with me. That doesn't make them false teachers. Now I think that teaching is false. It doesn't make them a false teacher. Because if they believe the Bible is the Word of God and we agree on the majors, we are saved by grace, but we disagree on some of the minor things, my friends. We don't stick the label false teacher on them because they have one or two things that we disagree on. That's why in my course on the Holy Spirit, I put two quotes by people who do not like each other. John MacArthur and Benny Hinn. 
And I remember people said, how could you do that? Because I agree with John MacArthur on a lot of things. I disagree on cessationism. But it doesn't make him a false teacher because he teaches on cessationism that I disagree with. And I agree with Pastor Benny on a lot of things. I may disagree with some of the other things and I don't wear his type of suits. It doesn't make him a false teacher because I disagree with certain things on him. Now if those men will get up and say Jesus is not the way to heaven, the Bible is not the Word of God, there's many ways to go to heaven. Yeah, that makes them a false teacher. Amen. Oh, but this pastor, he only preaches on faith. He only preaches on positive things. And what's wrong with that? Most of us will benefit from that. But he doesn't talk about these other things. He might not be preaching the whole counsel of God. It does not make him a false teacher. In the Old Testament, the way somebody becomes a false prophet is if they speak for God when unappointed. And secondly, if they lead people to serve other gods. In the New Testament, Jesus says false prophets are recognized by their fruit. Apostle Peter said false teachers are those who deny Christ, exploit believers for personal gain, and abuse Christian freedom, neglect their duty. Meaning if somebody gets up and says, the Bible says drunkenness is sin. No, getting drunk is not sin. That's false. But we disagree on alcohol. We all agree drunkenness is sin. But we disagree, what does it take to be drunk? And we will fight about that till we go to heaven. And Jesus presents wine in front of us. <laughs> and then all of us, like myself, who don't drink, will be like, oh Jesus, uh, I was teaching your people to stay away from this. <laughs> yeah. We disagree on tattoos. We disagree on a lot of stuff as Christians. And that's okay. Disagreeing and disrespect are not the same. Disagreeing and destroying somebody who Jesus died for is not okay. Amen. Now the last thing that I wanted to share with you. In the conclusion, pay attention to what you give your attention to. Your ear is your womb. Whatever you listen to, either bad or good, is conceived and will be given birth in due time and season. Choose what you listen to and what to ignore. Mark 4 24 says, then he said to them, take heed what you hear, for with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. America has top foods, top 10 restaurants in the USA. The first one is McDonald's, second one is Starbucks, third, third one is Chick-fil-A, fourth one is Taco Bell, fifth one is Wendy's, sixth one is Dunkin' Donuts, seventh one is Subway, eighth is Burger King, ninth is Domino, uh, Domino's, and tenth is Chipotle. I find it very interesting, we have an appetite for unhealthy things. We have an appetite for things that are fast, not necessarily healthy. I wonder if that culture slipped into the church. Most of us have an appetite Quick to judge, quick to anger, slow to listen, lacking critical thinking. Give me something quick, give me something sensational, give me something that is junk food. I'm not saying it's poison. Okay, Everett will disagree with me. It is poison. <laughs> the junk food is poison. You're not going to die from eating junk food. You will die faster and you will not be healthy. As a church, we don't eat personally, our leadership team. We don't feast on junk food, on spiritual junk food. We don't want us to be a church that has an appetite for unhealthy things. People sometimes come up to me and they say, why don't you judge more of other ministers? I say, I personally don't eat that so I don't have it on the menu. I can't offer to you what I don't consume myself. Have you watched this documentary? No, I have not. Have you watched this thing? No, I have not. I fasted and I prayed and I read the Bible. Does this doesn't mean that I'm not aware of what's happening? I am aware, but I do not want to be aware of what the enemy is doing more than I'm aware of who Holy Spirit is and what he is doing. I want to eat healthy food and I want to ask you this year, Cut away some of the drama. Cut away some of the junk from your diet. Do not live on Christian soap opera. Now there are ministers and pastors. Some of them are my friends. Some of them, they're good people. Some of them been to Hungry Gen. They just love that stuff. There are people there. And if that is your appetite, I just want to tell you something. God bless you. You're going to do you. But we're going to have to do us. 
and our desire I don't want to be a fast food minister who's quickly to judge, quickly to speak, quickly to anger, quick to come to conclusions, lack critical thinking, possessing a critical spirit, having cognitive bias, systematic error in my thinking, filtering information through my preferences, exposing heresy hunter, drama, division, name calling. That's not my diet. I don't eat that. I don't serve that. Why don't you rise to your feet?